This episode of Ben Franklin's World is brought to you by DelanceyPlace.com. Very simply, Delancey Place is a brief daily email with an excerpt or quote that is interesting and noteworthy. The emails always include a bit of commentary, so you have the context you need to fully see all the interesting points in the excerpt and to consider its thought-provoking ideas. The excerpts have no theme, although most come from nonfiction books and articles, and one of the places selected excerpts come from most is history books. So for example, the excerpt from February 10, 2017 came from Rebecca Riddell's 2016 book, 1666, Plague, War, and Hellfire. The excerpt discusses the economic rivalry between the Dutch and English during the 17th century. It was a rivalry that prompted the English and Dutch to engage in three wars for trade and empire, and for the two nations to conquer each other's Atlantic colonies, like that time in 1664 when the Dutch took Suriname from the English and the English took New Netherland from the Dutch. And yet, although they rivaled each other for trade and power, there was much to bind the English and Dutch in friendship. The English supported the Dutch in their revolution against Spanish rule during the Eighty Years' War, both nations adopted and celebrated Protestant religion, and both the English and Dutch celebrated a love for art. If brief information of this type interests you, why not sign up for Delancey Place's free daily email? Text nonfiction to 22828 or go to dp1776.com and check out Delancey Place. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Kovar. Hello, and welcome to episode 124 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. What did the American Revolution mean and achieve? What sorts of liberty and freedom did independence grant Americans? And did the revolution mean to grant liberty and freedom to all Americans? Americans grappled with these questions soon after the American Revolution. They debated them formally during the Constitutional Convention of 1787 and in their first Congresses, and they debated them both informally and publicly as they followed events in revolutionary France and Haiti during the 1790s and early 1800s. In fact, Our guest historian, James Alexander Dunn, believes that we can and should use the Haitian Revolution to better understand how Americans grappled with the legacies of the American Revolution. So today, we're going to explore this intriguing idea by investigating how we can use the Haitian Revolution as a window onto the American Revolution. During our exploration, Alec reveals details about the Haitian Revolution and its connection with the French Revolution, the accuracy of the news Americans consume from Haiti, and Americans changing views about the Haitian Revolution and how those changing views affected their ideas about the American Revolution. But first, are you ready for some free books? I know I said I'd host a book giveaway about a month or so ago, but I totally misjudged my calendar and I just couldn't do it. So now I'm going to host an even bigger book giveaway, and I'm going to do it on Wednesday, March 15 at 9 p.m. Eastern in the Ben Franklin's World community on Facebook. So If you'd like a chance to get a new copy of one of the books we've discussed on the show, a book I've culled from my personal library, or a book that a publisher sent that just wasn't a good fit for the show, you need to join our Facebook group. It's free to join. All you have to do is visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the orange Join Now button on the home screen or text BF World to 33444. Okay, are you ready for our Caribbean American adventure? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is an assistant professor of history at Princeton University. His interest in race, identity, radicalism, and revolution led him to focus his study of early America on the Atlantic world during the 18th and 19th centuries. Today, he joins us to explore how Americans understood the Haitian Revolution and how they used that revolution to better understand their own revolution. With details from his book, Dangerous Neighbors, Making the Haitian Revolution in Early America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, James Alexander Don. Thanks so much. Great to be here. We're excited you could join us, Alec, because we haven't explored the Haitian Revolution too much, and your work seems to indicate that we should absolutely be paying attention to the Haitian Revolution because of the window it provides us onto the American Revolution. I agree, yeah. I'm happy to be part of a growth industry in the history business because it seems like more and more folks are thinking about this important set of events and how it relates to the early American past. So, Alec, 
your book, Dangerous Neighbors, explores the Haitian Revolution and how Americans understood that event and used it to better understand their own American Revolution. There's so much to talk about here. So why don't we start with the American Revolution? Would you tell us how you think Americans understood the American Revolution at its end in 1783, or perhaps 1789 if you're a historian who subscribes to that idea of the Long Revolution? Sure. That's exactly the right question to ask, I think, because if you're going to think about revolution the way I'm thinking about revolution, and I think it's the way we should be, you want to think less about a single understanding and more understandings. It's a way to recapture what I think was the reality for the folks in this period, which was that the meaning of the American Revolution in 83, 89, 90, 1800 was still being very much debated and it was up for grabs. These are folks who almost universally agreed that independence from Great Britain was a good thing, although there were folks who had not thought that was true. But what that independence meant and what values stood behind it was very much up for grabs. So you have a real fluidity in American political culture that I think well, American historians in general are working to recapture at this point, but certainly my study shows it to be true and makes you want to focus increasingly on this vital decade of the 1790s and the early 19th century, when not only are the arguments being conducted important and the meaning of the revolution being forged in certain ways, but it's also just really entertaining to watch these American politicos battle it out and to talk about you know, how this past that they agree upon as a great thing reveals in their debates the divisions they have over what it meant. So since you brought it up, what were the great arguments over the meaning of the revolution? Did they have anything to do with who Americans thought were included in the revolution and what liberties and freedoms they gained with independence? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly the crux of the debates. You know, now that the ideals of the revolution are being celebrated and embraced, the questions of how they're going to translate into the pragmatics of statecraft really is where the rubber hits the road. And as that rubber hits the road, people are thinking about, you know, the meanings of those ideals and talking them over. You know, how far does American equality go? What are the implications for this commitment to liberty and independence for the institution of chattel slavery? Does this new polity need to have a single sort of transcendent meaning for the issue of slavery? These are all up to grabs. It goes through debates over the extents and the quality of American citizenship, the questions of how people from other countries or other parts of the world will come in and either become or not become parts of an American citizenry. And it goes to the debates over how the varying economic and, and sectional interests in this new polity are going to fit together into something that can be called a nation. So we have all these debates. Debates that, you know, later periods we'll see, you know, going on into the, the period of the American Civil War and, and even beyond, happening right as the first Congresses and, and the nascent American political cultural institutions like newspapers and, and such are being built and forged and developed. So it, it's really a vibrant and wonderful period to look at. It really seems like the Haitian Revolution allowed Americans to grapple with questions over the legacy of the revolution. And I'm excited to talk about this aspect of your work. But before we dive into that conversation... Would you provide us with an overview of the Haitian Revolution and its important events? We tend to think of Haiti and too often make it a marginal place, a place that uh, is ridden with you know, natural disasters or human-made disasters. But you know, a vital starting point to this discussion is that in this period, the period I've just been talking about, it's entirely opposite. Saint-Domingue, this French colony, is arguably the most successful, the most important plantation colony the world has ever seen. It's producing untold wealth for its metropolitan master, France. It's producing something like more than two-fifths of the world's sugar, this really important crop, this money-making crop, a vital chunk of the world's coffee production. So this tiny little sliver of the island Hispaniola, about a third of the landmass that Columbus landed on, it's like the Silicon Valley of the 18th century. And that makes it a place that Americans look at very closely. They're doing a lot of business there, doing a lot of trade there, especially in the wake of the American Revolution when they're shut out of the British West Indies for a while. And so when the Haitian Revolution or the events that we now understand to be the Haitian Revolution begin to transpire, they're looking there very closely and they're deeply involved with those things. What they see goes roughly in phases. It's a complex, about 15 year or so series of events. Early on, it's a competition among factions of whites. This is in 1789, 1790, as the French Revolution has begun. And those white groups in the colony are waging different fights over the nature of the changes in France and their ramifications for the colonial possession of Saint-Domingue. So this is a fight that they'll wage with the American polity very much in their vision. They wonder if the new changes in France are going to lead to a greater degree of autonomy for this colony, a greater degree of free trade, free trade with the United States maybe even independence, although that's not something that they come to lightly. And then you have other folks who are trying to resist all those things and trying to 
preserve metropolitan authority, trying to preserve their own position in society, if they're metropolitan officials or something. And you have some violence that happens around these events, these struggles. That violence is the context for another phase. And this is when a group of the colony's population, known as the gens de couleur, or the people of color, and the people Americans call mulattoes, who themselves are pretty significant numbers, about 50,000 of them, so more than the 30,000 whites or so, who want these same French developments, especially since they're being, in France, talked about in terms of liberty, equality, fraternity, and the rights of man. They want those developments to serve as a way for them to gain greater civic equality, greater membership in this newly enlarged French citizenship. They want this because they've increasingly been the subject of discriminatory and prejudicial policies in Saint-Domingue, despite the fact that they are, in many cases, significant property owners, they are slave owners, they are educated. So they're hoping to take this moment of French development and turn it into an opportunity for themselves. And more violence happens around that struggle. This contest between and among the slave-owning classes in Saint-Domingue is the context for the more famous and more widely known moment of Haitian history, which is the insurrections of August 1791, when an unprecedented number of slaves rise up first in the colony's north province, the Grand du Nord, the North Plain, but then in various and related ways across the entire colony. Within weeks, tens and tens of thousands, 80,000 slaves are in arms. Too many folks think this is the whole Haitian Revolution. And of course, to contemporaries, people just saw this as a recognizable but a really big slave insurrection. But nevertheless, it is a distinctive one, one that really does condition the way things go from there on out. In reaction and response to this, different groups have to change their tune. The white groups largely unify in self-defense, although as the violence between the slaves and the, the white population continues, various groups try to make inroads to try to establish any sort of stability. The first inroad that the French metropolitan officials make is to grant full civic equality to the people of color, the gens de couleur. That's a pretty big moment in French revolutionary history, one that I don't think we talk about enough. They create a statement of full civic equality and membership in the French polity for people of color, creating a basis for raceless citizenship in France. And that does create some stability, but not a lot. And the next phase, I would say, involves an even more radical moment in French revolutionary history, a moment when these metropolitan officials harried and in retreat against some of their opponents offer full liberty to any slave who will side with the French. And this is really an amazing moment in French revolutionary history, certainly also in Haitian history. This happens in June of 1793 in Saint-Domingue, but it is seconded and expanded in early February 1794 in Paris, when, with very little debate, the French National Convention decrees that not only any slave who fights with France declared free forever, but any slave in the entire French empire are declared free if they side with France. So they end slavery as a fait accompli all at once and without any compensation to the masters of these folks, without any provisions for taking these now ex-slaves and removing them from French society. In fact, they are vitally to be incorporated in French society. They're supposed to be serving as soldiers in French armies and to some degree citizens. That's a really big moment and that really changes things in Saint-Domingue. Not all slaves join the French. Many slaves have already attained a degree of freedom (laughs) simply by rebelling. They don't need the French decree to sort of give them the freedom they've already secured. But the tendency over time generally is for the insurgent slaves to side with the French armies, to become the French armies, quite frankly. And that leads us to the next phase in which these now French insurgent armies turn away the various opponents to the French Revolution. They're fighting on behalf of the French Revolution. The first opponent they turn away is the Spanish, who have invaded from Santo Domingo across the mountains in Hispaniola. The next opponents they turn away are the British, who have invaded from Jamaica, and among other places, as an attempt to try to maintain a slave society so close to the British West Indies. And then finally, these insurgent slaves, and I'm I'm really accelerating my little summary here, turn away the French themselves. With the rise of Napoleon, the French turn their back on this emancipatory decree they had put forward in 1794 and seek to reimpose slavery in Saint-Domingue, Guadeloupe, and other places. And the insurgents, who are now French soldiers, turn away this attempt. This happens in 1802. And by 1804, they've declared themselves to be this new independent nation of Haiti. A really amazing transition when you think about it over the long span. They've taken this colony, this archetypical plantation colony of Saint-Domingue, representative and kind of an expanded representative of what a plantation society can look like. And they've replaced it with this completely sui generis, unique nation of Haiti 
one that you know is like no other, though it's the second independent nation in the hemisphere. It's, it's completely different than its northern neighbor, the United States. Citizenship there is predicated on being of color. Whites are prohibited from owning property. And most centrally in this new polity, slavery is banished and abolished forever. So it's a really amazing transformation, and Americans watch it just with fascination. Wow. That sounds like a full 15 years worth of events. <laughs> yes. Now, a couple of times during your overview, you noted that the Haitian Revolution was connected with the French Revolution. Was the Haitian Revolution part of the French Revolution? Were they two separate events? How did the connection between the two really work? It's only recently that the Haitian Revolution at all has been put in the same sentences with the French Revolution and the American Revolution by historians. Contemporaries would not have been able to fathom it being anything but related to the French Revolution. In fact, Americans, you know, they don't have the word Haiti <laughs> to say, so they can't call it the Haitian Revolution until 1804. And frankly, they don't even use it then. They invariably, and this is true in Great Britain and uh, elsewhere, call it the French Revolution in Saint Domingo, <laughs> as they called Saint Domingue. So I think it's impossible to separate the two. And that's not just true because of the fact that contemporaries saw it that way, but I think because they are interrelated. Without the changes in France, you don't have some of these moments of tension that provide context for different developments. You certainly have in any plantation society the capacity for violent and radical revolutionary change you know, because of the degree of oppression that slavery constitutes. But without the particular ways that the authority of the master classes became contested and compromised, you can't see the unfolding Haitian Revolution as going the way it did. And you don't have those tensions without the French Revolution. So they're inextricable in my mind. Well, we can certainly see from your description why Americans would be interested in this event or events, because not only was France their ally during the American Revolution, but they're trading partners with what we now know as Haiti. Which brings us to how did Americans follow the events that were taking place in Saint-Domingue? Well, you know, uh, closely. <laughs> Not only are they fascinated by the dramatic facets or portions of what's going on in this place, but they're vitally interested in an economic sense in them as well. Americans make a lot of money trading with French saint -Denis. Not only because, as I said before, they're shut out for a period from the British West Indies, but also because this is the most valuable and, and most lucrative and most important colony the world has ever known. It's a plantation colony. It doesn't generate sufficient food to sustain itself. And so where does it get its food? Where are the calories supplied that makes this labor possible? It's from American mid-Atlantic states. It's wheat and corn from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, these sorts of places. So Americans are really interested in seeing how that trade's going to go. And then we have to remember that this is before the telegraph. In an age of sale, for two places that are far away from each other to know anything about each other, a human body has to go between those two places, right? Information just doesn't move without a human body in this period. And yes, we have, you know, the odd traveler and tourist who might go back and forth. But the reason that most people move in the 18th century is to do business. So Americans are not only riveted by what they hear about, but the basic information transferal itself is only possible because of this business interest that Americans have there. So to answer your question more directly, you know, how do they get their news? Well, sea captains, these merchants and, and sea captains sending letters or personal accounts move back and forth between saint domingue and various American ports. And once they get there, they invariably, as is always the case, are met by newspaper men. Newspapers are really important in the young American polity. They're exploding at an unprecedented rate and being started and developed in ways that no other nation has ever seen them. Newspaper editors meet these captains, get the letters they brought or the accounts they tell or the proclamations they ferried and put them in their newspapers because they're interesting, but also because of this trading issue that I've mentioned, just the commercial importance. And my book is really taking that as a starting point and noticing how that movement, that information moving from these, these wooden vessels into these paper vessels facilitates or brings the words and the ideas that they conveyed into American political discourse and becomes part of this conversation about how revolutions work and what they look like and whether what we're seeing over there is the same thing we had or not. You've looked at a lot of different records from Haiti, from the United States and elsewhere. How reliable was the transference of knowledge from wooden vessel to paper vessel? Like, how reliable is the news from Haiti to the ship captains to American newspapers? Uh, unreliable in the most direct sense. 
It's very interesting as a historian to read these accounts, and some of them seem familiar. If you've read enough Haitian history, you think, oh, yes, this sounds familiar, until you realize that the evidence in the modern-day Haitian history is some sea captain you're reading, who you know (laughs) is just, you know, putting things together best he can, and is therefore not a great source for a use by a modern historian trying to prove something that actually happened or something deeper about what happened. In fact, there are some Haitian histories with errors in them. I'm not the one who's found these errors, but others have that are based in the errors of, you know, these poor ship captains who are just doing the best they can. Because, you know, these are often people who don't speak French, for one thing, who are by the nature of why they're there in Dominican port cities only. They're not in the interior. They're often, if they go into the cities themselves, as far as I can tell, are often on the wharves only. <laughs> they don't go deep into the cities even. So when they're seeing things, we have a couple of wonderful moments of great evidence historians like to find of listing things they saw from their mastheads. We saw the smoke rising on the horizon. We saw the flames besiege the town. We saw the troops moving this way and that way. That's literally what they saw. (laughs) So the eyes are a fallible organ, right? We don't always know exactly what we're seeing and our words don't sufficiently or always reliably convey what it is we understood to have seen. So these things, of course, inherently unreliable. But I would say it's as unreliable as anything is in this era and maybe in any era. And so, you know, the fun, the interest is to see how these fallible accounts, and I would say, just to expand on it, the letters that people bring back, you know, which you might consider more reliable, are also unreliable. So all sources are unreliable to some degree. They you know, get translated by these editors who are interested, you know, have their own sets of interests. We need to be careful. They're not interested in objectivity in a contemporary journalistic sense, of course, right? They are not trained journalists in any sense. They are purveyors of a different kind of news, a news that increasingly, as American political fights develop, are meant to serve particular domestic political ends, uh, either siding with the Jeffersonians or siding with the administration of Washington or Adams or, you know, whatever. So they, you know, sometimes take these unreliable accounts and bend them to their own needs, making them serve as evidence for their own domestic issues. So the whole thing's unreliable, and that's kind of the engine that makes my book go. I'm quite happy that they're unreliable. So we have these unreliable accounts, but regardless of their reliability, this was the news that Americans were receiving. And we discussed earlier that the Haitian Revolution takes place over 15 years and that it encompassed many different events. I mean, let's start dissecting this a bit. Let's go to the early part of the Haitian Revolution. How did Americans react to early news from Saint-Domingue? Well, the factional fights among white factions are sort of fell through, read as tea leaves for how French developments, as they understand them, are going to implicate American trade. You know, in the old regime, there are only three ports that Americans can do business with in Saint-Domingue, and therefore those ports can be regulated by French metropolitan officials, and various customs duties can be levied very efficiently, and those metropolitan officials can dictate what comes in and what comes out, and, and this sort of thing. Trade is, you know, meant to serve the French nation, right? And so they want to regulate that trade. When moments of violence happen, as it had before when, say, a hurricane happened, sometimes new ports are opened up. Sometimes some trade regulations are loosened. And so Americans are interested in a commercial sense to see whether or not these developments are going to become permanent, whether this should be seen as the beginning of an independence movement. Certainly some French planters and other parts of the white factional fighting talk about it. This is a little bit like what we saw in Boston, or this is like a little bit what we saw in the United States. In other words, is this the beginning of an independent nation that will trade with us? So that's something they're reacting to. Then there's a lot of reaction and a lot of interest, more than I think others have noticed, in this violence done by the Jean de Couleur, the free people of color, making a bid for the French Revolution to be inclusive and race blind in terms of its citizenship. That really opens up a new phase of interest among Americans ardent interest. They put a lot more meaning into these fights than the French do, than French historians have done, I think. They really are wondering if this is, again, a sign of a global tendency towards an enlarged citizenry, something that's going to show us about how republics work in terms of race. These sorts of questions get asked and push back against, I should say, as well. But there's certainly a real significant and sincere interest in figuring out if this is a harbinger, if French citizenship is going to transcend racial lines and therefore, you know, what that would mean for American Republican citizenship. And then, you know, I would hasten to add that the moment of insurrection, which is not really a moment, but a series of insurrections spreading unevenly around the colony after 1791, attracts all sorts of interest, of course. There's the kind of lurid interest in stories of mayhem and destruction that is certainly a part of it, but also the same sorts of or related sorts of questions about whether this is what happens in a slave society and therefore, you know, should be taken as a lesson, an object lesson. 
one line of interpretation would be slaves are men, men naturally and tend towards liberty. So what causes slave insurrections? Slavery, <laughs> right? Another line would be, you know, slaves are, you know, not fully men perhaps, and therefore, you know, need slavery to keep them on. And, and what causes slave insurrections? Tampering with slavery by outsiders who don't understand the institution. People who are saying like the Jean de Couleur or French anti-slavery activists that maybe slavery should be done away with because of the ideals of the French Revolution. So this, as you can already guess, you know, serves all sorts of domestic contemporary arguments in the United States as well. And the use along these lines you know, continues. When civic equality is granted, that happens in April 1792. There's a thread of American discourse that celebrates it as, you know, just another step in the advance of the rights of man, right? And then when others will say, this is a horrendous, you know, horrible development that only unwise and radical French wackos would take. But, you know, that same line exists when the French decree emancipation in 1793 and early 94. People will say, and say, this is what should happen in a republic that's devoted to the ideals of liberty and equality. And others will say, no, it isn't. <laughs> this is the, precisely the problem with overextending these, quote unquote, French ideas. So that's some of the ways that the Americans react to these early developments. So it sounds like in this early stage, Americans were doing what we tend to do today, right? We get news and we try to place it in a context that we understand. So they were trying to place the French Revolution and the early days of the Haitian Revolution within the context of what they knew, which was the American Revolution, an event that they just lived through and witnessed. And this makes sense. But during your description, you also started to describe something like a second phase where events in Haiti went from being French and in the context of the French Revolution to being more like what you call in your book French Negro. Would you tell us about French Negroes and what Americans were thinking about them and why they started to frame the Haitian Revolution in terms of French Negroes? Yeah, that's exactly the right question, because it's a phrase that gets deployed over and over. And so I luckily, or because I spent so much time thinking about these issues, when they rang that bell enough in the record, I started hearing it. <laughs> and it's a phrase that I noted different resonances in over time. So when Americans and again, they have a variety of ideas about this term, but when they talk about it in the period I just talked about, say 1790, 1791, into 1792, they're thinking about insurgent slaves. They're thinking about uh, slaves that rise up and asking those questions that I just outlined about why that takes place and whether it's something that's universal and natural in some sense or something that's particular to this particular French colony. And so the resonance there in, in saying French Negro is, yes, they're Negroes, but this is, you know, Negroes who are, in this case, particularly French. They're coming from a French colony, but they represent a more general tendency to enslaved people, Negroes, everywhere. Because slaves had rebelled before, right? That category of action existed for these people in their minds, these observers. The question was, why? And, you know, there's some answers that already existed out there. Uh, slaves rebelled, you know, in some way you know, to acquire a greater degree of freedom or to flout the restrictions placed on them. These kinds of actions had been done before. And when they had had some degree of success, they came from in the form of marronage or maroons, as Americans would call them. This idea of escaping from slavery, setting up some sort of uh, quasi-independent enclave outside of the rounds of where white authority can reach and just acting independently from the rest of the enslaved world, right? And so early on, French Negroes are that, these maroons, but they are being to be dangerous in some sense. Maroons that have somehow got the potential to act as a contagion in other slave societies. If other slave societies hear about these actions or come in contact with these insurgents, they too will unravel slavery in their local context. So that's one of the resonances early on. By the latter portion of the period that I was just talking about, the post-French emancipatory period, there's another way to understand these folks, not as a contagion, not as a pathogen that's going to infect another slave society, but as a rational extension of French and to some extent revolutionary Republican ideals. These are the folks who are going to serve in French armies, who are going to, after the rise of Toussaint Louverture, be the leaders of this French colony. And so, you know, different commentators will have different ideas about whether those are good or bad things, but they are seen as particular to a French colonial environment. Again, however, you know, think about the way I just talked about it, maybe also as harbingers of a spread of equality and anti-slavery elsewhere. So there remains this kind of expansionist, cosmopolitan sensibility around these folks. There is, of course, another way to understand all those things, and that's to place less of an emphasis on the Negro and more on the French. 
to say, okay, even if we understand these French citizens, these black folks as French citizens and as legitimate participants in the French civic polity, they're French. <laughs> they're not British. They're not American. In other words, this experience does not transfer. It is not a universal, small R Republican kind of development. And that's another way of understanding these. Another thing to note when you see them using these words, French Negroes, is where they're putting the emphasis. Over time, among American audiences, even those who are going to voice some degree of approbation of these French emancipatory slash Haitian self-emancipatory actions are going to say, okay, even though I see that as rational and reasonable, it's something that happens over there. It's not something that's going to happen here. It's something that is sui generis to Hispaniola or San Domingue or wherever they're going to talk about it. I think the big question here is, as we move into this post-French emancipatory period, this post-1792 period, how do Americans who are mostly white and live in a slaveholding society react to the idea that San Domingue is a place that is outlawing slavery? You noted that some Americans viewed them as rational revolutionaries, but really, how many Americans viewed Haitians that way? Well, certainly you go south of the Mason-Dixon line and the reaction you know, we don't know what the reaction is among whites, because all we have in a public political discourse is, just as you say, a fear, a horror, a playing up of the violence, the destructiveness, and a way of pushing back and saying it's wrong in any sense that this is a reasonable extension of revolutionary ideals. Absolutely, you're right. But above the Mason-Dixon line, and I, I don't want to presage the sectional divide here, but you know, above the Mason-Dixon line, nevertheless, there's much more variance. There's a greater degree of fluidity and an understanding and to some degree acceptance of these developments as reasonable. We have to remember, this is the same moment when in Pennsylvania, thereafter, and other places, slavery is seen as a problem that needs to be dealt with. And in Pennsylvania, they deal with it through this Gradual Emancipation Act beginning in 1780. You know, so it's a different kind of emancipation. It's not all at once. It's not uncompensated, but it does provide a way for slavery to glacially, gradually go away in this portion of the polity. And that this is a model that's followed you know, in other portions of the states that we would call the North, right? There's also, however, and this is something that applies more nationally, there's also a question about whether or not this new American polity needs to have a single answer to this problem of slavery. In other words, should the Pennsylvania model or some other model be applied to the entire nation? You have anti-slavery activists putting forward petitions in Congress in 1790 and in 1792 suggesting, yes, let's act on this problem. So there too, you know, the, the Haitian example, what we would call the Haitian example, the events in San Domingue are part of what they're talking about, saying, you know, this is a problem and it produces violence. Let's do it in a way that's not violent. Let's do it in a way that deals with this problem everywhere and deals with it now rather than you know, through some sort of cataclysm. And that's a line of argument that is not bounded by the Mason-Dixon line. This is a line of argument that in different ways, Virginians will talk about, uh, North Carolinians will talk about. We don't have too many South Carolinians and Georgians talking about it in these terms, at least among the white population. But nevertheless, people are you know, convinced that slavery is an issue. Now, ultimately, ultimately, that question is going to be answered. It's going to be answered in a certain negative way through the way politics works in the first Congresses. There's going to be a decision that, no, the United States doesn't need a single answer to the problem of slavery. It's going to have a variety of local answers to the problem of slavery. And in some of those localities, slavery is going to endure. In some of them, it's not. And so there isn't going to be a single national answer to this problem. That's one of those moments when even those who look to San Domingue with a degree of acceptance say, OK, that's the French way of dealing with it. We have an American way, and American ways into their minds better or more suited to their local context. So, yeah, you know, that's exactly how it functions in some of these debates. We've seen two great transitions here. First, we've seen early Americans looking at the Haitian Revolution as something recognizable because it's French. Its actions are for liberty. And then we see a transition as the 1790s wear on and Americans say, OK, this is really a French Negro event because it doesn't quite look like our revolution. And we're not really sure what to make of it because freedom for slaves, should slaves even be granted their freedom? And of course, we've seen some Americans say yes to this question and others say no. But Alec, in your book, Dangerous Neighbors, you also note a third transition into how Americans viewed the Haitian Revolution. And you do this when you note that Americans begin to see it not as a French or French Negro event, but simply as a Negro event. Would you tell us about how Americans came to view the Haitian Revolution as a Negro event? You mean how it comes to be seen as simply a racially understood place? Yeah. Sure. And I would say as well, that option is there all along. I mean, race is 
is inescapable, both on the ground in San Domingue, you don't have uh, you know all these developments cataloged for you there without you know, ideas about race and the way they function in this particular polity of San Domingue. Slavery doesn't exist, or race is an important way that slavery functions, right? And nor can you therefore have any hope evading a racialized understanding of what's going on in San Domingue among American observers. They understand that they have slavery in and amongst their own society, and they're also well aware of the way race works as part of slavery in San Domingue. So, you know, as I said before, there's always a line of understanding in ways that Americans are looking at these events from 1790 on that says this has nothing to do with blackness, right? This is what blacks do when they evade slavery or when they fight or when they achieve independence or when they achieve a degree of autonomy, you know, then there's a way of understanding it's thoroughly racialized. They, they are seen as Africans. They are seen as, in some ways, atavistic agents, you know, to be manipulated by bad whites or by ideas that shouldn't have been introduced to society in the first place. The point of my book is to say, yes, that's there, but so too is all this other stuff that you've already asked me about, these other kinds of questions. And so the arc of the book is to show how that racialized, fearful, quote unquote, horror kind of picture, the one that makes San Domingue simply a metonym for black violence, which is there from all along, but in addition to all these other things, by the end, that's all that's left in white political discourse, this singular picture of a savage, quote unquote, society a society that is not representative of anything except for maybe the need for slavery to contain black nature and these sorts of things. But there's a whole lot of ground to cover, you know, to get there is the point of my book. I mean, even in the latter portion of the decade, these threads of understanding that allow for more nuance and less thoroughly and singularly racially defined ideas exist. I mean, after all, the Adams administration treats with Toussaint Louverture quite closely as part of its bid to beat off France during the Quasi War. And Timothy Pickering, Adams's Secretary of State, you know, presides over a really close diplomatic contact, one that is self-interested, to be sure, but is also, you know, has some degree of understanding that, yes, okay, we're going to treat with this guy because he maybe he's not, you know, emblematic of a, a trend of black emancipation everywhere, but it's emancipation in this place, and we're not going to reject that on its face. We're going to find them as they are, and we can get things done by having this relationship with them. So, Adams and Pickering preside over a pretty close diplomatic relationship. Some of the first American naval battles after the revolution are fought off the coast of Saint-Domingue against the French Navy, also against some of Louverture's opponents and their armed boats. Adams and Pickering preside over helping Louverture dispense with some of his internal enemies, some of whom are white French, some of whom are people of color, and in many ways ensure that he reigns supreme by 1801. In this new, it's not an independent polity at this point. It's still technically a French colony, but it's one where he is thoroughly in charge. So, yeah, is that seen as a, as a racialized moment? Absolutely, by Adams's and Pickering's opponents. This is when the emergent Jeffersonians are holding that up as a sign of how corrupt the Federalists are and how perfidious their intrigues are. They're giving gunpowder to the killers of white planters, you know, this sort of thing. But Federalists are able to hold that off. To throw some of the Republican Jeffersonian words in their faces and say, I thought you said all men were created equal. I thought this is just a man. We should treat him just as, as we treat with anybody else. So, you know, the position of San domingue changes and works as a political gambit. And increasingly, that political gambit is a racialized one. Increasingly, the way to use this place in American political discourse is to think of it as a place that is first and foremost black and therefore tells you something about those who are interacting with it. As you so aptly noted, we've been really focused on talking about white political discourse in the United States and how white Americans viewed the Haitian Revolution. Jennifer would like to know more about how African Americans viewed the Haitian Revolution. Was the African American understanding of the Haitian Revolution different from white Americans' understanding of it? Well, I mean, African Americans are dealing with the same sets of stimuli, the same information that European Americans are. So in some sense, absent some sort of alternate source of information, they have to take the place as it is presented, which is not to say that is entirely a white production. There have been lots of really interesting work talking about black mariners and the information that they bring back and forth as parts of these commercial contact that we talked about earlier. But by and large, the portrait of this place is one that comes through a white lens, if you will, or white voices. And so African-Americans have to be very careful. It's not a politically viable or a smart thing to do to hold up, say, the slave insurrections and say to white contemporaries, look out or this is going to happen to you. So when that does happen, you really have to pay attention to it. And you can find echoes of it. In 1793, as part of a bid to 
create an independent African church in Philadelphia and to fend off some pretty nasty attacks by Philadelphian whites against the African-American community in the wake of the yellow fever epidemic. Two African-American leaders, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, make a deft and sort of quiet reference in a pamphlet they write saying, yeah, I'm paraphrasing, we see the violence in Zandamang and we bemoan you know, both its causes and its consequences. You know, we don't like, in other words, the slaying of masters and all that, but nor do we like the violence of slavery itself. And so if you love your children, and that's a closer quote, you should take care of this problem, white America. So there's that kind of careful use. But, you know, I would note that it's a use of Sandemang at that point as a source of black violence alone, as, as violence that's meaningful for slavery. So they haven't evaded or found a different use of the news from Sandemang. Now, we do have even more suggestive and sort of hint-like evidence of the meanings taken by people who are enslaved in the United States of these events. There are a host of insurrection plots and conspiracies that are either products of white horror and imagination or real. Uh, in some cases, we don't know. But in 1793, a letter is found on the streets of Richmond from one secret keeper to another secret keeper. That's what they call themselves in Norfolk, saying that it was almost time to rise, that you know, we're going to do things like they did it on the French island, that there were French helpers who were maybe going to be involved, French white helpers who were going to be involved in some sort of insurrection, that there was another group that they were coordinating with in Charleston, South Carolina. This causes great unrest, as you can imagine. It's another use of the name French Negro. This is, you know, Virginian officials talking about how the French Negroes had infected their local Negroes and who were you know, more likely to be placid and stay calm, but were being led astray by these other folks who were coming in. So there's hints that people of color who were enslaved knew about these events. I wouldn't go so far to say that they were inspired by them. I think that would be pushing things too far. I think people who are enslaved don't need other people's actions to you know, make them aware that they're enslaved and therefore the need to act. They were probably in some degree always in resistance to whatever conditions of enslavement that they were experiencing. But again, it provided an opportunity for that resistance to take a different form. In this case, seemingly some sort of organization or threatened organization. So it's there, and it's being used as a call, a recruiting tool, you know, a focus of debate, and that sort of thing. Was that 1793 letter that was found in Richmond the only instance we have of enslaved people looking towards a Haitian revolution for inspiration? Because Kyle wonders if any Haitian emigres ever came to the United States to incite slave revolts, or whether slaves in the United States took inspiration from the Haitian revolution and attempted to revolt against their slaveholders. Yeah, I mean, most emigres who come from Saint-Domingue are white, and some of them bring their domestic slaves with them. We have very few insurgent slaves who are being brought. Of course, they're insurgents, right? There is a moment in 1794 when there's some worries about a particular group of slaves who are alive with Spain, who are found in the aftermath of a particular moment of violence, to be off the coast of Florida, and, and the Florida officials mobilize a militia and get rid of them and deport them to Spain very quickly. So there's very few, you know, that we know of insurgent rebels who are moving outward. And that makes sense if you think about it. They're engaged with their own struggles. So what I would say in answer to Kyle's good question is it's the ideas about these people <laughs> that travel, and as I was just suggesting, seem to have inspired or potentially inspired some sort of degree of mobilization among domestic American, African-American enslaved populations. And by the same token, what's important is that it's the white ideas about that that really are the most salient kind of export. There's very little evidence that the Dominion polity, as it emerges by, say, 1801, has much interest in exporting its revolution in any sense. There's one moment in 1798, I believe, when there's an effort by the part of the French and at this point, it's people of color as well that are on the side of the French to export and to attack Jamaica. But that is not something that is done by the people of color in Saint-Domingue. It is the product of the plans of the white French metropolitan official, a guy named Edouvi, who wants to export revolution to attack British holdings. Right? And you know, there's other moments that come from Guadeloupe and other places where it's seen that French revolutionary forces, not having much of an army on the ground and not much of a navy either, see these folks, enslaved people, as a way to attack planter societies. It's something Americans worry about, but I don't think it really happens. This certainly becomes part of the fear of what this environment produces. This scary French radical revolutionaries who are going to come in and tamper with our slaves and use them against us. That's part of the horror image that gets developed in the South and elsewhere. It's, it's distilled into a phrase and becomes equated with this French Negro phrase at this point of these Jacobin infiltrators that people worry about. So we don't have a ton of evidence 
But there are echoes. Uh, even Gabriel's revolt in 1800, this is in Richmond. There's rumors that, you know, who's going to be spared when Gabriel and his followers take Richmond and create a kind of enclave for freedom for African-Americans in Virginia? Well, we're going to spare Quakers and we're going to spare any French whites that are part of this. And there's even some rumors that there's two French agents who are involved. But again, they're white. They're not insurgent slaves. Alec, it's clear from your book, Dangerous Neighbors, that you've put a lot of thought into the question of how Americans' interest in the Haitian Revolution shaped the way they viewed the American Revolution and its legacies. And I wonder if you would tell us more about your thoughts on this. Well, I think expanding the lens to include ideas about what's going on in the rest of the world, and this includes France, but in particular this place that Americans are so interested in, this French colony of Saint-Domingue, and all the vital and interesting things that are going on there to Americans, makes you understand, makes you see and appreciate possibilities in the American political moment that I think we don't necessarily always see. We tend to think the American Revolution and and the question of slavery, question of equality, and either see it as the revolution is something that is ultimately transcendent, you know, that doesn't produce liberty and equality right away for all, but does eventually, maybe in 1863, or maybe in the 14th Amendment, or maybe in the Voters' Right Act of 1965, but ultimately gets it done. Or We tend to see the American Revolution as something that promised liberty, promised equality, but was undercut by craven political interests in this very period. What I think my book shows is that neither one of those is exactly right, that these debates were out there, these ideas were being bandied about, and the way those debates and ideas unfolded and worked or didn't work is contingent, is contingent on all sorts of events. And these events include events in Saint-Domingue. Without Saint-Domingue, you don't have as vibrant a discussion about equality, perhaps. Without Saint-Domingue, you don't have as pointed a defense of slavery as evolves. So in other words, by taking this wider lens, by looking at this broader view, this Atlantic view, really, you get to appreciate both the revolutionary radical possibilities for equality and the end of slavery that people really legitimately talked about and thought about and wondered about and advocated for in some cases, and the opposite to that, the pushback the reticence, the constraints, the clamping down on those possibilities that ultimately was followed. So I think you get a better picture of both possibilities and therefore what the constraints led to. You get a better appreciation for what a Jeffersonian polity as it emerges in 1800 really is based upon. It's based upon a politics that embraces liberty and equality, but is, does so on a thoroughly racially defined basis, one that, you know, that liberty, that equality is for whites alone. And that wasn't the way all Jeffersonians were talking all along. It's time for the Time Warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if Americans had continued to view the events taking place in Saint-Domingue as French and French Negro? How would viewing the event in terms of culture and ethnicity instead of of race have affected early American-Haitian relations and American participation in the Haitian Revolution? Uh, That's a great question. My mentor in graduate school, John Murren, was a a big fan of the counterfactual, and I I won't pretend to be as good at them as as he is, but I'll give it a shot. I mean, I think there's two sets of answers to your question, or two things to consider. In terms of American-Haitian relations, I think it's actually easier to imagine had Americans been able to, in other words, maintain the sort of fluid and nuanced understanding of what was going on there, to imagine a Haitian future that looks pretty differently than it eventually turned out to be. With Haitian independence, this is a nation besieged, right? Jefferson has turned his back on the Adams and Pickering diplomacy has essentially cut saint and then Haiti off from American goods, although American goods still go into the place for a while. And Haiti itself has got to maintain a defensive posture. So its wealth, to the extent that it can generate capital, is devoted to defensive measures and is after an attempt to sort of become a member of the larger family of nations, after that's thwarted at French behest, it is sort of a besieged place that can't really exist on the larger Atlantic framework. Had Americans not participated in that cordoning off of Haiti, things would have obviously been very different for the young nation. And you could imagine all sorts of, maybe unprobable, but some sort of trading alliance or trading relationship that would endure well into the 19th century and beyond. 
The second bit, though, thinking about how this maintenance of nuance might have affected American participation or American understanding of nation evolution, well, that's the whole kit and caboodle right there. My book suggests that, you know, had this degree of nuance been maintained, say this high point of anti-slavery fervor and possibilities that was existing circa 1793, 94, I think it's not unreasonable to think that in the face of that, an even more hardened pro-slavery development might have taken form in the United States, and we might have had an even earlier rupture than we do than in 1860. So I mean, your hypothetical points towards is a lack of the political resolution of the problem of slavery as it was achieved in the 1790s, and therefore the continuance of this really divisive potential of slavery. So maybe we have a civil war in, in 1819 instead of a Missouri Compromise, or maybe you have it in 1790, or maybe a political solution is achieved where smaller republics are established out of a, a northern or mid-Atlantic and New England confederation and a Chesapeake and a lower south confederation, something like that. In other words, putting on full display the divisive capacities of the institution of slavery in the American political experiment. Now that you've explored the Haitian Revolution and considered what it can tell us about the American Revolution, what aspect of the Atlantic world are you researching and writing about now? I'll be candid with your listeners. I've spent a long time writing about what people thought about stuff <laughs> with this perspective. I'm a little tired of that. I want to think about what people did. <laughs> I want to spend a little more time thinking about actual folks and how they moved around. There's lots of individuals in the book that I just wrote, but I want to follow people and their doings more closely. So what I'm going to look at, if all goes according to plan, is the impact of various regimes of emancipation in the Atlantic world on how people moved how people moved around this space. So I'm looking at slave flight, looking at migration patterns, both illicit and illicit, and thinking about how places like Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Delaware, Maryland, fit into a wider Atlantic world that includes increasingly a place that's called San Domingue and Haiti, but also Guadeloupe, Jamaica, Cuba, the Lower South, the Chesapeake, and New England, trying to see how these patterns of migration let us see the space in a different way. So that's where I'm going next. Alec, where is the best place to find more information about you and how we can get in contact with you if we still have questions about the Haitian Revolution? Please do contact me. Obviously, email. My email is on Princeton's webpage, and that's certainly a good place to find out about other things that I've written and am doing. But also, I'm on Twitter at AlecDunn1, and Dangerous Neighbors has its own webpage on Facebook. I post things on from time to time. So any of those would be uh, great ways to get in touch with me. James Alexander Dunn, thank you so much for taking us on a whirlwind tour of the Haitian Revolution and what Americans thought about it. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. The Haitian Revolution gripped the attention of early Americans. They couldn't get enough of it, so they followed it avidly in newspapers and talked about it everywhere and anywhere they could, in Congress, in the streets, and at social occasions. And overall, they seem to have been simultaneously fascinated, horrified, and dumbfounded by what was going on in Saint-Domingue. But these emotions and thoughts only seem to have spurred them on to try and make sense of what they were reading and hearing about Haiti. And they often tried to make sense of Haiti's revolutionary events by placing them within the context of something they did understand, the American Revolution. At first, this comparison and context was an easy and sensible one to make. The revolutionaries in Saint-Domingue sought independence from France, just as Americans sought independence from Great Britain. However, as the Haitian Revolution became more violent and openly opposed to slavery, it forced Americans to rethink what they were reading about. Should slaves have liberty and freedom? Should liberty and freedom be granted to all Americans equally? These questions form the core of a vibrant debate where some Americans answered yes, others no, and many others wondering, did there need to be an all-encompassing answer for the nation? As Alec related, the Haitian Revolution offers us a really interesting lens through which to view these debates and the questions they caused. Look for more information about Alec, his book, Dangerous Neighbors, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash one, two, four. If interesting ideas and information about history interest you, why not check out Delancey Place and their daily excerpts and commentary? You can sign up for their daily email by texting nonfiction to 22828 or by visiting dp1776.com. Finally, what do you think of using the Haitian Revolution as a window onto how Americans grappled with the legacies of the American Revolution? Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.